Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Bridge Science for July 2020. Hosted, of course, by the University of Queensland, and I'm your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands on which we're meeting tonight and to pay my respect to elders both past and present. If this is your first Bris Science, it's of course a very special online Bris Science format. Welcome. Bris Science is a series of free public lectures on science held once a month in Brisbane and now online for the whole world um, and brought to you by the University of Queensland. And our aim is to share not just the best researchers, but also the best communicators to share their research and their passion for science. Um, we're going to get to our speaker shortly, but just a couple of little bits of housekeeping. Firstly, we have a presentation tonight for about half an hour, and then there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, we'll be doing that through the Q&A function in your Zoom window. So that should be at the bottom of your screen, Q&A. You can ask your questions there throughout the night, or there'll be an opportunity to add them towards the end. And we'll try and get to as many of those as we can during the session. Um, tonight's video is being recorded and will be available on YouTube as are all past Briz Science talks, but your names and personal details won't be visible, nor will the questions you ask um, other than what I read out. So um, do, do feel free to get involved. We'd love to have some really great questions at the end. And finally, there will be a short survey at the end of the talk where to get your experience of the evening. So stick around for that if you have the time. All right, I think that is enough preparation and housekeeping, so let's get on to tonight's talk. Some of you may have noticed that there is a small pandemic going on at the moment, and hence Briz Science's online format for now. Unsurprisingly, this has required an incredible effort from our scientific and technical community, from health specialists, economists, manufacturers of protective equipment, and obviously from medical researchers, such as uh, Professor Paul Young, who spoke at Briz Science last year about his work on how to create much more uh, rapid vaccines. His work at UQ, and he is now working on a COVID-19 vaccine. Briz Science is nothing if not cutting edge, however unfortunate. Uh, but the pandemic has also required massive modelling efforts, presenting a range of fertile problems for mathematicians and physicists to solve. So tonight, I am very pleased to be welcoming Associate Professor Yoni Nazarafi from the School of Mathematics and Physics at UQ. Yoni is a data scientist and statistics expert in everything from queuing theory to machine learning. But tonight, he's going to talk about how he's applied his research to modelling the spread of COVID-19, and in particular, his safe blues fame framework for safely simulating viral transmission. So to tell us more and to give us insights into some of the learnings from his work, please put your virtual hands together for Yoni Nazarafi from UQ. Thanks a lot, Joel. Uh, hi, everybody. Let's see if you can see my screen. I assume you can. Um, yeah, so nice to be here. Uh, thanks also uh, to Emma and Phoebe and the others that helped organize this uh, great thing. Um, so yeah, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, actually, in Australia, we thought we were at the end of a pandemic, but uh, the last couple of days uh, have shown us that no, um, we might be uh, going into a second wave, certainly or probably in Melbourne and Victoria, maybe elsewhere. Um, so what I'll speak about is, is are some aspects dealing with, uh, with, with modeling pandemics, um, a bit of that. Uh, and then I'll focus on Safe Blues, uh, which is a framework uh, that together with colleagues from uh, the University of Melbourne and uh, from MIT and from Cornell we've, we've devised. And uh, this, this framework is not being used uh, to date, but we actually believe that uh, this can make positive impact. Um, so let's see what you think about it um, as we near the end of the talk. Um, so before we go to the next slide, there's actually a poll to put out. Um, and I think that we can put out this poll. So you, this is an interactive talk. So you, there's two, two places where you can answer. So the first poll, uh, you might see the first question. 
And it has to do with how many people, are, this, is, this is reflected, by the way, answers are anonymous. It has to do with how many people are so close to your heart so that in the unfortunate event that if they uh, unexpectedly died, um, then um, you'll be heartbroken. And this will lead us to the next slide. And now this is a public talk. It doesn't have much mathematics, but actually the next slide, which we see is, is uh, which you'll see in a second, is, um, ha has more equations than any other slide uh, in this talk. Uh, I hope you can make some sense of that. Um, so I assume that everybody can see the general answers. So we see that there's pretty much a mode at around uh, five, uh, but quite a few people um, really love 10 people, 20, and there are some serious lovers here that like uh, 20 or more. So let me, let me go to the next slide and let's see what this is about. So I'll, I'll close the poll at this point. Oh, I see. Only now, maybe only now you could see the results. So ignore the slide for a second, you can see the results. So um, a single person loves zero people and uh, Quite a few people uh, love about five, and by I mean love is strongly love, and we're at uh, 20 people that uh, love 10, 13 that love 20, and 14 that love uh, more than 20. Okay, and this puts us at, uh, at this thing. Let me just see how do I get this screen to go away. There we go. So now some numbers, and perhaps not great numbers. Uh, so probably most of you have seen the various COVID dashboards. Uh, the John Hopkins one is one of the most famous ones, really. Uh, checking this morning, there have been more than half a million deaths from COVID, um, and that number is estimated. And uh, more than 11 million confirmed cases, and that's, um, that's clearly, uh, there's some noise there that's probably an underestimate. But if we take the ratio of these two things, and that puts a death rate for an individual person about 4.5%. So that means that about one in 20 people that uh, get COVID are likely to, or can perhaps die. Now, of course, th that statement as it is, is wrong, right? I mean, because it depends if you have pre-existing conditions or not, heavily depends on your age. And that estimate is probably a bit high just because we are underestimating the actual number of people that have COVID. So there's a whole bunch of noise around that. But the thing is that many people treat 4.5% or even if it was 10% or maybe 1% is not a big chance. I mean, it won't happen to me. Uh, but a simple calculation shows that if you love about 10 people, meaning that if one of these 10 people are gone from this earth unexpectedly, and if COVID progresses through the population unchecked and ends up with infecting about three quarters of us, 0.75% of us, um, then the chance uh, for each individual of losing a loved one um, or more sits at around 30%. That's a simple probabilistic calculation. So one minus F times P is the chance of not losing a loved one, raise that to the power N or 10 in this case. And that's the chance of, of none of these loved ones being lost and take the complement and you're at 30%. Now, of course, this is very noisy. So if the death rate of COVID is 1%, then you only have about a 7.3% chance of losing a loved one. Uh, but if you're one of those people in the poll that love a lot, uh, then there's a bigger chance. Now, there's no intention to scare here, but it's actually at the phase uh, in which we're at at the epidemic, uh, where some of us are uh, relaxing a bit more and others less. And by relaxing, I mean not following government orders, etc. The point here is that um, probabilities add up in a certain way. And... Uh, if you love 10 people and uh, there's a small chance for each individual one to die, there's a quite more significant chance that somebody will die, unfortunately. Just one of those sad facts of life. But let's get more positive. We're fighting back. So, I mean, we, we, we've been living through this uh, for um, some of us for almost half a year, some of us for four months, depending on where we are in the world, uh, in, in Australia since around uh, uh, early March. Uh, a variety of things, and you know, you know what these things are. Uh, they involve social distancing, they involve changing uh, contact behavior, they involve contact tracing apps, uh, testing, um, and uh, even different ways to hug your grandmother. And eventually we might be, um, we might be saved by a, um, by a, um, a vaccine, uh, but there's no, um, that's still not around the corner, not just yet. Uh, social distancing also hurts. Uh, obviously, right? So 
some of us have lost our jobs, uh, being at home can lead to, can lead to depression. Um, it's not so simple to uh, lock everybody up and just hope that the disease goes away, there are costs. Um, so indeed, some governments are certainly doing their best, or at least what they think is their best, uh, to find a sweet spot. And that sweet spot is the trade-off between uh, locking everybody up and not. Uh, in fact, in Australia today, there was just an announcement that the border between the state of Victoria and New South Wales uh, will be closed, uh, I think, the day after tomorrow. And that's not an easy decision, but uh, these kinds of decisions are being made all the time. So how? Well, this is a huge field. Uh, there are, of course, clinical aspects uh, on which uh, I know uh, almost nothing or effectively nothing. Uh, there's a lot of economic aid that's being discussed uh, that's dealing with the economies being closed and such. Um, but we'll focus on the third pillar, and that's uh, modeling to inform policy. It's modeling to inform policy. So let's look at a bit of a timeline of the past hundred years. It's uh, kind of sadly convenient that the Spanish flu was just 100 years ago, or exactly 100 years, and that's a unit of time that we live with comfortably. And um, let's look at some advancements that have happened uh, since between 1920 and 2020. And I basically put three types of things here. So in the late 20s and early 30s, uh, there was a huge push uh, to develop differential equation-based models for uh, epidemics. And that led to what's used a lot today that's the SIR model. We'll speak about that, the susceptible, infective, recovered, or removed model. Kermick McKendrick's theory. Um, and then after World War II, um, with the advent of computers, uh, also fueled by the Cold War, et cetera, computational statistics really took off. There was a bit of a slowdown in the 60s, but certainly in the past decade, uh, there's been a blow up of what uh, machine learning can do, artificial intelligence, data science, that's all this. So that's all about uh, soft computing in a sense, uh, classification of dogs, cats, but much more. You all know about AI in one way or another. And of course, for the past 20 years or so, um, almost all of us have uh, smart mobile devices of sorts. And all these aspects um, take part in kind of modeling to inform policy and the information technology aspect of dealing with uh, policy. So if we look, for example, at the first uh, component at the SIR model, then many of you in Australia would uh, remember that about two months ago, the uh, Australian modeling was released. So the, that's uh, a bundle of papers um, that were developed mostly by uh, researchers at the University of Melbourne, but not solely. And these papers are kind of had models of how the pandemic would evolve through Australia. Uh, such modeling efforts have happened in other places around the world also. It's important to note that the technology in these papers, while these papers are, are, are very well done and precise in many ways, the technology is in a sense anachronistic. So it's, uh, it's based on the, on the early theory. On, so if, if uh, Kermack and McKendrick would look at those papers, they would, they would understand them after having to uh, just shuffle through a bit of slang or two, a slang bit or another. Now, if we think about smart mobile devices, then that's a completely different aspect, contact tracing. Um, here, here in Australia, we, we have the COVID safe app and in many other countries, we also have the COVID, we have kind of contact tracing apps. And the whole idea of contact tracing apps is uh, to um, see if you are in the proximity of somebody that has later been diagnosed and then ideally in an anonymized manner, um, you will be contacted, hey, you were near somebody. And these apps often use Bluetooth communication. And that's kind of related to the Safe Blues idea that we'll speak about. Now we have here our second poll. And at the risk of having the slides freeze, let's launch the second poll. And that has to do with the question if you're actually using COVID Safe. Again, the polls are anonymous. It's kind of break even. 43 people are using COVID Safe, 43 are not, and three are not in Australia, so not able to use it. Um, I can assume that you can see these results. So about half of us are, are using COVID safe or so we said in this poll. And I think that the numbers in Australia are around 6 million. We have a population of 24 million in Australia and there's about 6 million users uh, for this app. Although up to a month ago, the app um, has only been known to uh, detect a single case so far. So 
you know, we're using smart mobile devices. We're using uh, all the differential equation based mathematical biological models, but how about computational statistics? Well, the fact is that AI has not really made its mark on COVID, not yet. I mean, COVID is the first thing, half year old, but uh, AI is supposed to be big and wonderful and very capable. Um, and AI has still not been used. A lot of that is for the reason that uh, there's not a whole lot of data. And our safe blues method um, is a method that we'll get to a bit later in the talk is uses all three pillars, smart mobile devices, computational statistics, and classic modeling. All right, so just before we get to safe blues, let's just, let's just play with epidemics just a bit so we see that we're on the same page. Uh, so a lot of you would have heard about the reproductive number, R. Sometimes it's called R sub zero, sometimes R effective of T. Uh, there are different names, but essentially it's the number of secondary infections that an infected individual induces uh, by coughing, by handshaking, by seeing, by spreading the disease. Um, the nice thing about a single number, we can kind of see how behavior occurs uh, just based on that number. So if you look at the right-hand side, if you just think about R being 1.4, uh, Julia, here is my calculator. That's some programming software. So if I take a thousand and multiply by 1.4 times 1.4 times 1.4 times 1.45 times, so that's kind of five periods, I grew from a thousand infections to over 5,000 quite quickly. Uh, so that's what we call exponential growth. Exponential decay would be with R less than one. You multiply a thousand by, say, if R is 0 0.7, uh, then you quickly kill the epidemic and you're down at 168. And it's the left-hand side that pretty much happened here in Australia uh, once we uh, started with the lockdown uh, in, uh, in mid-late March. So what's R for COVID? Well, R is actually not a stationary quantity um, and it depends on different aspects. So what actually affects the reproductive number R? Well, we can kind of break that uh, effect into maybe four different categories. The first would be the biology. Well, the biology of us, maybe our cats, if they also get it. I hear that cats can get it, but dogs don't, but the human biology, but also the biology of the pathogen. Now, biology is rather stationary, although of course, uh, viruses can mutate and there's a whole bunch of research on that, on different strands of COVID that have been mutating uh, during this period. Nothing extremely conclusive as far as I know. So that's biology. The second aspect is environment. Uh, how we live, the climate, which changes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the third aspect is conduct. Uh, do we shake hands or not? Do we wash our hands regularly or not? Do we wear face masks? Um, that's the third aspect. And the fourth is the contact. And that's actually the proximity, the physical proximity uh, between us and other people. And of course, we've reduced that. I mean, you're seeing me here on Zoom and we're not face to face, no real nibbles. So it's social distancing goes to affect the fourth quantity. And all of these quantity, all of the, this fourth, element, all of these elements affect the reproductive number, R. So we don't know exactly what R is, but let's play a bit with an SIR model, a susceptible, infective, recovered, or removed model. Um, I won't speak about R just yet, we'll get back to R, but I want you to see kind of the dynamics of an SIR model. Uh, now, often when people speak about SIR models, they write what's called the differential equation. So that's a uh, functional relationship between different functions. But in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that people are these little dots in this uh, left half plane that you see. And the little dot can either be susceptible or infected. You might see a few red dots, either the infected or uh, removed. And removed here is broken into recovered and dead. And these dots diffuse randomly which is clearly not realistic. That's why this is a toy model. Still, it captures pretty much the dynamics of an SIR model. So they move randomly, and when an infected dot is near another dot that's susceptible that has not been infected, guess what? Infection occurs. So if we move a bit forward with this model, the dots have diffused, and you might see on the left-hand side a few uh, more red dots, and as you can see here on the right-hand side, the number of infections has grown. Now this line that's sitting at about 400, that's a hospital capacity. So back in the time when we were hearing in the headlines all the time about flattening the curve, it was about flattening this red curve. And this red curve in this specific simulation has now passed the hospital capacity. Now in this theoretical toy simulation, uh, the 
period of the disease is about 20 days. So it takes about 20 days for people to get recovered. But look what's happening here at around times 20. So first of all, deaths are a bit more death, but also you can see a bit of a flattening of uh, the infection rate. Now that happens because the number of susceptibles is decreased. So each dot, each red dot that's moving around and looking to infect other individuals actually find less susceptible individuals. And indeed in the SIR model, the growth rate is proportional to the product of the number of susceptible and number of infected. And then the model can continue and we can run on. And when we get to such a phase, we often say the epidemic has run its course. Now let's look at this specific epidemic. What we see is that at around day 40, when the number of infections cross below the hospital capacity, we also put in this model the fact that the death rate is dependent on the fact if hospital is above capacity, if the hospital beds are full or not. And that's something we, we expected certainly to be here in Australia and luckily it didn't happen. It's kind of happening in the United States at a different point in this time. So then death rates shoot up. Okay. And you see that the final size of the epidemic, if you add the number of dead and the number of recovered, so that's just a, maybe around 450 and the number of recovered is around 1300. That's the total, pro that divided by 2000 is the total proportion of people that were infected. That's kind of that number F that we had on that first slide. So a lot of modeling of epidemics deals with these types of models. But of course, this model was extremely toyish. People don't just move like dots, uh, like random dots. So models try to be a bit more realistic. Still, frankly, it's very difficult to get a good model of reality and make good predictions. However, we can uh, reach uh, qualitative uh, conclusions from such models. And let's look at this version here, where you'll notice that I've put these bars, these vertical and horizontal bars in the spaces of movements. And that's actually what's happening now to our friends in uh, Victoria and Melbourne. So some people cannot move out and in over their suburbs. So they're confined to these suburbs. Even people in these high rises in Richmond, uh, in Melbourne cannot leave their buildings, right? So people can only infect the people around them. If we run everything in the same way, but people cannot infect through the walls and only are confined to diffuse, to move randomly within the walls, we let, we let this epidemic run, we see that the curve has indeed been flattened. But of course, this is at a great cost, the cost of, that we're having to pay for social distancing. Okay, so how does social distancing work for non-toy models? Hmm. I mean, that model was, nobody moves around like some random dot. And the big problem is that we can't really tell. There has still not been a successful mathematical model that looked at COVID, that looked at population, that looked at people moving and said, oh, this will be the projection of what we do in, in, in terms of behavior. In fact, the, the number R that's been put into models is often an exogenous quantity, an external quantity that one puts in. So social distancing is hard to explicitly model within the model. And this is where our idea, our idea of Safe Blues comes in. Uh, by the way, you can go to the safeblues.org website, more talks there, more information, read the paper. We released the paper, it's, it's a quite readable paper. We released it back in April. Um, at first we were expecting to see this implemented in certain countries. We're actually hopeful about that. Speaking to uh, people that are advising governments in uh, Uruguay, Slovakia, Argentina, France, and Finland. Um, however, there were quite a few barriers and there was also a bit of a slowdown in COVID, so a bit of the hype uh, was reduced. However, we see now that certain places, uh, Australia perhaps, Israel perhaps, um, other places as well are, are seeing their second wave. And there might unfortunately be a third or a fourth wave. So we actually think that there still might be room to make impact with Safe Blues. Let's see, let me tell you what's it about. All right. so. Um, Safe Blues is about simulating the actual virus by spreading tokens, which we call virtual safe viruses, among people on their mobile phones. That's what it is about. Now, the viruses were spread are not computer programs that actually run on the phone. So a virus is often executable code, but rather tokens that are being passed. So the general idea is that you have a server and this server infects 
certain individuals, individu randomly selected individuals, individuals that participate in the Safe Blues program. And these then can infect their peers, et cetera. And what the server sees is an aggregated count of how these virtual epidemics are spreading. In a sense, it's a very simple idea. The server does not see the location or the identity of the people. It only sees aggregate information. So in a sense, it's privacy preserving. Although like with any apps, there are always privacy issues. For example, somebody might be able to be de-identified if she or he are extremely unique. Importantly, Safe Blues is not contact tracing. It's not about finding who is sick or who is near a sick person, but it's rather about evaluating trends in the population in real time. The general idea is that the R, the reproductive number of COVID, is what you see on the left, can be sort of mimicked by a whole bunch of other reproductive numbers or virus spreading behaviors that you see on the right of the safe blues, of the virtual safe viruses. Now, COVID has the biology, the environment, the conduct that play a role. But these other viruses, they don't have that. They just have their, and we invented a word here, their bluetoothology. So different strands of safe blues spread in different ways. Never in the exact way as COVID. Safe blues strands do not stay on surfaces like COVID might. Safe blue strands might even spread through a wall and COVID does not, but Bluetooth fires through walls, so Bluetooth communications between phones. However, the ensemble of many safe blue strands can actually give us vital information for knowing the state of COVID, or so we believe. Let me show you a demonstration. So here is a, another virtual fake simulated epidemic, and these are these red dots simulated over days. And as you can see at around day 14, social distancing was turned on. So this epidemic was growing at first kind of at an exponential rate and then social distancing was turned on. R was changed from being something greater than one to being something less than one. And the epidemic slowly diminished. Now in parallel, safe blue strands were also circulating via the same individuals that are simulated here. And none of the safe blue strands follows the exact path of the epidemic. Everything is stochastic, everything is random. However, the ensemble of safe blue strands resembles the epidemic in many ways. Now, the thing is that at any given day, we do not see the state of the epidemic. Ask anybody how many people are currently sick in Queensland or in Melbourne, and we won't know. We'll only know after a delay of about five to 10 days, depending on how we test, et cetera. And of course, then there's also false negatives. So here at about day 100, we're about to turn social distancing off, and we do. And we continue for two more weeks, social distancing has been turned off. By the way, it doesn't have to be social distancing that's turned off. It might be a, uh, an important Black Lives Matter demonstration or something else like that, some other event, but think that social distancing was turned off. So we're at day 115, and we still don't know the state of the epidemic, but we see what happened with the safe blue strands. They grew. At this point, what we can do is we can run a machine learning model that predicts the red curve based on the ensemble of the blue curves and the new blue curves. And our new prediction, our prediction tells us that that's a, that's a forward projection of what's happening. So it's an early warning system and it's saying, hey, even though we still don't see an increase in the number of measurements, there's an increase of infections, or at least there's a projected increase of infection. Let the simulation run more and you see that the actual infection was not far from the prediction. So we played with this with a bunch of models and a lot of machine learning and saw that this is a rather robust method and it kind of makes sense because if you can simulate a virus that is kind of like the real virus on cellular phones, then you can get pretty good signal and make good predictions. And then the story continues. So how did we test safe blues? Well, safe blues, exists now only on an experimental app that has still not been tested on real people. All of the testing has been on models and you know, paper, you can find all kinds of models. And the thing is that this is not a modeling exercise where we're trying to fit parameters to the models. It's actually different models that are significantly different. So one has spatial movement, that's model three. One has movement on a tree and one has static individuals meeting. They all um, have dynamics that are kind of similar, and that's the SIR type dynamics. 
And then for all these models, we can look at the safe blues signals and make a prediction. We can also use safe blues for a bit more. We can actually, if the system would run for a while and after you would train it, say on the first wave and then you use it on the second wave, or maybe you train it on the second wave and then use it on the third wave, you can make further inference and see how the system responds to social distancing and uh, imagine that the government would kind of had a, have a dashboard that would say, oh, if I do this level of social distancing, R is going to be at this level. If I do this level of social distancing, R would be at this level, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we believe that the, with the information that one can get with safe blues, this is possible. Uh, but of course, it hasn't been tested on reality yet. So um, this is a penult penultimate slide. Just to be clear, safe blues is not a contact tracing app. Um, but one success path for this project, um, we do believe it can be useful, is that it will be added to such an app. Uh, we're actually working with the Singaporean Trace Together uh, open source uh, software that's called the Blue Trace Protocol. Uh, in a sense, the Australian app is just a copy of the Singaporean app. Uh, the Singaporean government gave it to the Australians. Singaporeans also open source it. So we're, we're taking this app, doing it on Android, and hopefully after quite a few hoops, um, we'll have an experiment running at the University of Queensland and perhaps in the other universities, Cornell, MIT, and Melbourne, uh, and learn something about safe blues. But there's more to do until we can do that. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, if you do think this is a good idea, please let your government, uh, wherever that is, uh, know about it. Um, you can go to the Safe Blue site to find more information. And thank you. Thank you, Yoni, for a very interesting presentation. Lots to take in there. Um, we're open for questions now. So if you have a question for Yoni, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. While you are thinking through that, uh, Brit Science is back next month. And we should not forget that while COVID-19 is a massive disruption, it is not the only problem facing the world. And the big one looming is, of course, climate change. And so next month, we want to talk about solutions, not just problems to climate change. And so we're going to be hearing from Professor Catherine Lovelock from UQ School of Biological Sciences, who will be talking about the Blue Carbon Initiative. So not safe blues, but blue carbon, which focuses on mitigating climate change through coastal ecosystem management. So um, it should be a really interesting presentation. Make sure you um, don't miss it. All right, we have some questions coming through. Um, Yoni, first question is from Chris. Uh, we're gonna, and I should obviously point out that Yoni is a mathematician, not an epidemiologist. Um, so you know, I'm going to try and pick the questions that are most in your wheelhouse, Yoni. Uh, the first question is, what evidence is there that the lockdown worked around the world? Um, okay, so thanks for the question. Look, um, first of all, if one just reads, looks at the news, uh, you, you, you might see that the lockdown worked. Uh, we locked down things in Australia. Uh, the virus died. We're now slowly easing restrictions. And then it's those little stochastic effects of, of a meat factory or not a meat factory or a COVID hotel or not. And the virus maybe picks up or maybe not. And that's where things like contact tracing and contract tracing apps are supposed to uh, uh, kill these things. Uh, you can also compare the United States uh, of America uh, to, to Europe and, and just look at the, at the, at the trends and, um, and see how, how lockdown, um, what lockdown has done. Of course, there is real debate on, hey, is it worth it? Uh, you can consider the Swedish model, where uh, the thought was, uh, let's, let's reach uh, herd immunity and, uh, and actually lock down uh, the vulnerables, but there were some hiccups with that. Um, so in terms of evidence, I think that's the evidence um, that, that's reasonable. Right. Uh, I've got another question here, which is, Okay, we're not taking easy ones. Do you think the uh, Australia's COVID safe application is actually effective? I think that um, the the price that an individual pays uh, for running the Australian COVID safe app is is minimal. Uh, it maybe has to do with a bit of battery uh, on the phone. Um, the app seems to be privacy uh, preserving. The uh, 
the source was released, um, in, in my view, it has value. Uh, I still think that Australia as a nation can be a bit critical on the fact that it took us um, about a month and a half to take the Singaporean app and implement the, effectively a direct clone here. Um, and other ideas, such as the one that I presented here, uh, could have perhaps done much more. Um, now, I could see that there was a whole bunch of political issues with that because the minute that the app was released, uh, all the proponents, uh, sorry, all the opponents to the app were, uh, hey, you know, this is, this is breaking our privacy. So if in addition to that, you're doing virtual virus spread on this app, no, 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 no. Uh, however, in a situation like um, Nova, we, we would have seen, uh, we could have picked up some things perhaps a, a week or two earlier. Right. Um, Joshua would like to know, how did you model the infectiousness of the virus in the Safe Blues model? Oh, that's a great question. So the, the ideal Safe Blues parameters would be perfectly calibrated with COVID parameters. Um, now, as scientists playing with these models, uh, I say playing because we are playing with these models when we're writing a scientific paper, we need to, we need to be careful to say, hey, we do not, to assume that we don't know the exact COVID parameters, okay? And indeed, nobody knows the R of COVID in an untouched population. So it's somewhere between, estimates range between two and four. And that's a, that's a huge difference that makes, makes a significant difference. Um, but with something like Safe Blues, we have the ability of actually running many viruses, many strands uh, that, that span a big range of infectivity. And when we play with that infectivity, we also make the, if we have, if we assume that COVID has an R of, of say three, then uh, we would make the infectivity of uh, safe blues nine. So three times is infective uh, if only a third of the population uses safe blues. So we actually make safe blues more infective because it's assumed that only a very small subset of the population uses it. I'll just use this question just to say one more thing. So with contact tracing, you should know that if only a few people have a contact tracing app, it's useless because many people can walk next to you and somebody would be with uh, COVID and, and uh, she or he won't be traced. Uh, but with virtual virus spread ideas such as Safe Blues, uh, we believe that a penetration of only about five or 10% would already give you a good enough signal. Right, and that actually ties into another question that was here, so that's great. Um, and there's actually another related question from Chris, which is how you project forward using Safe Blues. Um, how do you model lockdown removal to get forward estimates, for example? Okay, so thanks, Chris, for the question. So the two aspects. Um, at first, it's already, it's not about projecting forward, it's just getting a real-time estimate of where the disease is at. Is at. We, need to, we need to keep in mind that we, with COVID at the moment, we're, we're looking two weeks back. So the people confirmed today are due to movements that happened two weeks ago. So answer number one, we're not projecting forward, we're actually just projecting now in real time. However, because suddenly we're not just looking at a single epidemic, we're actually looking at hundreds of different epidemics, these virtual virus strands that are spreading, then we actually have much more information. So we could think of COVID as just like another virus in this sea of virtual safe Bluetooth viruses. And we can use much more information to make a forward prediction that would be stronger, especially given social distancing. But one would need to train the system on safe blues. So say have safe blues. Well, we missed the first wave in most places, except the United States, uh, but or in Brazil. But you know, we'd need to train the system on a say a second wave and then make it useful on the third wave, et cetera. Right. Um, so I'm just looking, flicking through the questions here. We've got a couple of minutes left. So look, I, I think I might just move on to one more question, which is if you were funded a dozen PhD students, what would you do next? with this app and what well, I'm assuming sort of in this space. A dozen PhD students. That's yeah. a lot of students. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of time. Um, so the, 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 there's a big gap between uh, where and that relates to this kind of major uh, sequence of slides that I showed where we saw the uh, classical mathematical modeling 
SIR models differential equations and the contemporary methods that are very data driven. Uh, and in a sense, there have been kind of two communities operating separately. So you've got the statisticians, machine learners, and you've got the applied mathematicians, machine learners. Um, and I think what we're seeing in the, in the current pandemic is that there's room now to, to bridge that gap. Uh, so just like the 1928 till 1933 uh, SIR efforts came about half a decade after the, uh, well, almost a whole decade after the Spanish influenza, um, I think there are gonna be now a lot of efforts in, in bridging these gaps. So working with systems such as Safe Blues, but many other ideas, so just collect a whole bunch of data and try to put it in a model that's not a complete black box, but also not a complete detailed mathematical model uh, is a big open research question. Fantastic. Well, lots of exciting work still to be done. So if there are budding mathematicians and data analysts out there, you know who to contact about your, um, your projects and potential research. Uh, so at that, on that note, we are going to um, thank you so much, Yoni, for your talk tonight and um, for sharing these fascinating insights. It's um, unfortunately very timely, given, as you say, the current um, uptick in cases, particularly in Victoria. So, um, of course, everybody should continue to practice the social distancing, which Bruce Science will be doing for at least a little while yet. So make sure you join us next month. We have lots of thank yous coming in here, Yoni, on the uh, chat. All right. Thanks a lot, Joel. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, and we'll uh, chat to you soon.